and we are today looking at markets. Now this presentation may go over a little bit um, over the time limit because there are some videos I've put into the presentation to kind of um, work through with you, um, but I think they just might help uh, put things into context. Okay, so we're going to look at markets um, today, which is part of unit one, um, business A level or AS level. So first of all, looking at what a market is. So it's any place that buyers and sellers will come together to exchange goods or services, and there normally be an exchange of money at a set price for this. Now, the nature of a market is uh, takes numerous forms. It can be national, local, physical, electronic. Um, you know, your corner shop, stock exchange, housing market, the internet, online retailers like eBay and ASOS, for example. And then what competition is? So this is where the number of firms are operating in the same market and they are competing to sell similar products to the same target market. So that's what we call competition. We're looking at competition to start with. And basically, competitive advantage is a feature of a business that allows it to perform more successfully than others in the market. Now, businesses will employ many tactics and strategies to compete, and these include things like new product development, changing and improving existing products, maybe promotions, changing prices, improving distrib distribution. So it may be not just in retail stores that you're selling online, um, quality assurance and improved customer service, um, which requires your staff being trained to do this. So there's different ways in which companies will um, look at competition and how they try and beat their competition. Different types of markets that we're going to be looking at is you've got your local and you've got your global, um, you've got your mass or your niche, you've got your trade and then consumer. Um, you've got your product, you've got your service, and you've got seasonal. Okay, so just looking at what these mean. So, like your global or your local is that businesses sell into a small ge geographical area. So, that's your, your local. So, like your local butchers, your local corner shop, your local, um, you know, small businesses in the local area. And then you've got global people that are across the world. So, like multinational businesses like Nestle, for example. You've got your mass and your niche. Your mass is your large target market and your niche is your small target market. You've got trade. This is selling to other businesses and consumer is selling to private individuals. You've got your product or service. So your products are your physical, tangible products. For example, your car, your TV, your tables, anything you can kind of touch. And your services are your non-physical, so intangible items like services, like hairdressing or teaching or financial consultancy, et cetera. And then you've got your seasonal. So these are the type of things that might peak at certain times of the year. So like B&B &B, B &B bookings, for example, in the summer months, maybe ice cream in the summer months, Christmas decorations, Christmas trees, um, you know, uh, Baileys, for example, might be quite seasonal. Um, markets. So looking at your mass market. So this is pro a product is targeted at a wide range of people. You've got the market is not segmented. So there's no characteristics of types of customers are not important factor. They, they are there for everybody. Your products appeal to a wide range of customers and your products are widely available throughout a range of markets. And so mass media is used to advertise those products to the masses. Your niche market is you identifying small, currently unsatisfied gaps in the market. Target market is well defined with distinct characteristics. You've got promotional activities which are going to be targeted to small subsection of the whole market. So you might have things like um, maybe uh, social media advertising um, for particular niche markets um, from maybe what they particularly search and can often charge higher prices for your niche market. You've got your trade and your consumer market. So your trade markets where your business is selling to other businesses, and that's called B2B. Now, this is where technical specifications of products and service provided as a salesperson or account manager is likely to be more important than the physical environment. And then you've got your consumer markets where businesses are selling to the public, so B2C. And this is 
where the product and the price may be seen as equal importance to the physical environment. Um, but it doesn't matter. It does matter what channels products went through to reach the consumer. Then you've got things like your market data. So your market size is a total value or volume of sales in the market, and it can be measured in many terms, so like 20 billion or by the amount sold. So if one million cars are sold, and this is calculated as the number of units sold times the price. Now your market share is the proportion of the total market sales that a firm has. So calculated as sales of one firm divided by the market sales, total market sales, and times that by 100 to get your percentage. And then your market trends, and these are the overall changes in the market. So is the size of the market growing, statistic or, uh, static or declining, which businesses are gaining or losing the market share? And it's kind of analysing that as your business, trying to see where you're up to. Another thing is with regards to markets is your market segmentation. So this occurs when the market is split into subgroups of consumers with similar characteristics, and it helps identify different types of consumers and different wants and needs. Now, segmentation methods can include things like demographic, geographic, income and behavioural. Now, your demographic segmentation is identifying subgroups of population based on their demographic profile or characteristics. So here you're thinking about things like age, gender, level of education, race, religion, family size, stage of life, life, etc. And with your demographic, um, you need to think about what sort of business it is and where whether they will target um, those particular demographics. Demographic looks at the social and economic characteristics of individuals and of households as well. OK, so I hope that gave it a little bit of uh, market segmentation in context to an actual business. Um, so looking at market segmentation and looking at geographic market segmentation, it's where you define market categories based on where people live. So regions, cities, um, countries, neighbourhoods and people in different geographical areas play different characteristics and needs. So the south east of England is generally warmer than Scotland, for example. Tastes and traditions vary between countries. Infrastructure in rural areas would dis differ from that of cities um, and businesses need to take these into consideration and decide what sort of segmentation are they are wanting to do. You've got income segmentation so this is identifying your subgroups and market based on levels of income so you've got common methods of socio-economic groupings are what we see in front of us so you know, you could be grouped as A, which is your higher managerial, such as chief executives, B, intermediate managerial, such as solicitors, accountants, C1 is your supervisory, clerical and junior professionals, such as teachers and junior managers. Then you've got C2, which is your skilled manuals, such as plumbers, electricians and carpenters. Your D, which is your semi and unskilled workers, such as refuge collectors and window cleaners. And then you've got your E, which are your pensioners, so people like your casual workers, your students and you're unemployed. Looking at behavioural segmentation, this is where characteristics subgroup based on the behaviour patterns of the consumer rather than their, than their characteristics. So reasons for making purchases, for example, the needs, emotional rewards, frequency of purchases, time of purchase, brand loyalty, method of purchasing, so online or in person from shops, and the triggers, so like the response to digital marketing, is that making a difference? The impacts of market segmentation, so there's a number of benefits for business and customers of market segmentation. So advertising can be targeted more specifically, the most profitable and least profitable customers can be identified, least profitable markets can be avoided um, because there's no point maybe. It becomes easy to identify and launch new products. It helps a firm improve existing products and customer service. Businesses are better able to meet specific needs and greater variety of goods and services available in the market. 
So we're looking at competition now. So the competition, uh, competitive environment is a degree of competition in the market and the buying and selling power of customers and suppliers within that market. Now, a market structure is a number of firms within an industry and the way in which those business behave differentiating products. So there's different ways in which um, a market structure will um, sort of happen. So the three keywords there that we're going to be looking at over the next few minutes. So the model of perfect competition is based, it's like a, a theory and it's based on um, some assumptions. So the model of perfect competition is based on the assumptions that large number of there is a large number of producers, that there are identical products, that freedom of entry and exit and there's no barriers and it's readily available information. Now, a large number of producers, um, so imperfect, and again, this is a theory, the theoretical per perfect competition is that in perfect competition, there are a large number of producers in the market and each firm is relatively small in size and sell to a large number of small buyers. Now, all of these producers are price takers. They, they are not large enough to influence price. Each firm can sell all of its outputs at the current market price. Therefore, it would not lower its price. And if it were to raise its price, it would sell nothing as buyers would go to another seller. Then you have the fact that in theory, in perfect competition, identical products um, and that all products are identical. Buyers cannot tell the difference between products from different firms. Therefore, there is no branding of products and brand loyalty does not exist. This means that firms are unable to raise prices much beyond on the competitors. Now, in reality, firms are unlikely to sell identical products and even carrots will be different quality and branding will differentiate the product in the eyes of the consumer. Now, in perfect competition, that there's going to be no barriers to entry or exit. So this means that firms are free to enter or exit the market if they wish to do so. Therefore, entry costs will be low and non-existent. Barriers to entry, such as costs associated with capital expenditure, research, development, startup of the business, are low or non-existent. This means firms can move into the market if they see that profits are higher than normal. This restricts the opportunity available for firms to charge high prices. So this is the theory, again, of perfect competition. And that you have readily available information. So in perfect competition, um, you would have perfect knowledge. Perfect knowledge occurs when all econ uh, economic agents, buyers, sellers have comprehensive understanding of all factors within the market. Price availability. All buyers will have information about all prices and the availability of goods and services in the market. And all sellers have the same know-how in how to produce goods and services. The product, the same to the product, they, they produce the same quality of output. Now, imperfect competition is a type of market structure that exhibits some but not all elements of perfect competition. So the differences include here that there are less firms in the market, that there some form of product differentiation, that there are le least some barriers to entry or exit, the demand curve is downward sloping and suppliers can influence prices. So we're going to have a little look at a, a monopoly and what that actually means.
Okay, so what is a monopoly? So these are price leaders. They can charge high prices, but are often restricted from doing so by government reg regulations. New product development is not affected by competitors, and they tend maybe not to um, innovate as much as they could do. Monopolies will use promotion to inform and persuade customers. They can increase sales revenue through increasing market size. And how monopolies distribute and sell goods and services depends on the type of product. So, uh, for example, water companies must supply water to their region. Now, a monopoly exists when there's only one firm in the market. However, the government refers to a com any company that has at least 25% market share as having monopoly powers. Now, monopolies can exploit consumers by charging high prices. Therefore, monopolies are regulated in order to protect the customer. Barriers to entry in entry exit in monopoly markets stops firm from entering the market and these include things like high costs to enter the market, economies of scale, uh, larger firms are able to bulk buy um, and make things cheaper as they make uh, as they make products and legal barriers so only pharmacies can sell prescription drugs for example and pure monopoly has only one firm in the industry. Now a duopoly a duopoly exists where there is only two firms in the market. Like now, like monopolies, duopolies can also exploit customers by charging higher prices. Now, similar barriers to entry um, and exit that monopoly markets also affect duopolies, and duopolies tend to compete on non-price competition, such as promotion. Now, duopolies are often accused of collusion, so making agreements between each other that restrict competition, and this is illegal, and firms that collude can be heavily fined. OK, so an oligopoly exists where there's only a few firms in the market. So like monopolies and duopolies, oligopolies can exploit consumers by charging you higher prices. Now, they vary to entry or exit, particularly through advertising. They tend to compete on non-priced competition, such as promotion. And there's also maybe an element of collusion. And it's important to take into account the reaction of competitors when making decisions regarding prices. For example, if one firm cuts price and the others are likely to follow suit, resulting in lower income for the market as a whole. Now, therefore, this is unlikely to lower price as a long term strategy. Now, they exhibit the following characteristics. They don't tend to compete on price in the long run. Um, they might compete compete on price as a tactic, which is a short run maybe um, thing. They tend to spend heavily on new product development. So if you think about technical tech companies like um, Apple, Google, they, they are constantly, re and Samsung kind of looking at new versions of their mobile phones. Branding is going to be crucial and expensive marketing budgets are available and firms must ensure that their products are going to be successful. Now, monopolistic competition exists where there are a large number of firms in the market selling different products. 
Uh, this leads to a small degree of monopoly power as each firm offers something different to others. And in this type of market, barriers to entry are low. Therefore, it is easy for firms to enter the market and this creates a strong competition, which is good for consumers. Now, the mix between monopoly power and competition leads to term monopolistic competition. Firms within this market will try to brand their products. This might be through the building up of a reputation. And there are numerous examples of this type of competition, such as hairdressing, restaurants and health and beauty industry. Looking at barriers to entry and exit, is this where firms that are within an industry are protected from competition from outside the industry? Now, these obstacles may occur naturally or through man-made intervention. So they include things like advertising, economies of scale and financial. Then we've got product differentiation. So firms that try to make their product different to the competition by adapting the actual product in some way or by distinguishing the product through advertising and branding. Now, a business might have a product range selling a variety of goods and services to meet customers' needs. And with high competition in most markets, it's important that a business tries to differentiate itself from its competition in order to sell. Now, a USP is a unique selling point and something that distinguishes a firm's product from those of its competitors. And this can allow a firm to charge a higher price. When we look at demand. So a demand is the amount society is willing and able to buy at the set price given at any point in time. Now, a normal good is where if price rise, demand will fall and vice versa. There are an, there's a negative correlation to rising prices. The two variable prices and demand move is opposite direction for each other. Now, the relationship between price and quantity demand can be shown using what is called the demand curve. Now, a demand curve is a graphical representation of the relationship between the price and the quantity demand. And the demand curve shows the quantity demand for a good at any given price over a period of time. Now, as the price falls, quantity demand rises. And as the price rises, quantity demand is meant to fall. So if we look at this example here, so we have price and we have quantity. The y-axis is the price and the x-axis quantity and you draw the demand curve going down sloping from left to right and label it demand or d to find the quantity demand at any given price select p shown on the y-axis and draw a dotted line towards the demand curve and draw a dotted line down the x the x-axis to show the quantity now, it's important you master the drawing of the diagrams in business and marks are often lost for incorrect drawing of diagrams. So the rules are on the other side. So these are, make sure you are um, following those rules. Now, a change in the price is shown by movement along the demand curve. So a change in the price, for example, from P to P1 is shown by movement along the demand curve, lowering the quantity demand from Q to Q1. So you'll see that if prices rise and you dot along to the demand curve, and if you notice that Q1, you, the demand has gone down for that product because of the price rising. So a change in price from £10, for example, to 15 is shown by movement along the demand curve with the quantity demand falling from, let's say, 100, um, falling from 100 units to 120 units. So we'll leave it there. Um, hopefully that's been a bit of an introduction or a revision session for markets. Um, and I will see you next time in our next session, which is our final session before the live one.